the beginning phrase in the description of right concentration, we we chaka mehi, we we chaka gusalehi tamehi, secluded from sensuality, secluded from unskillful mental states. What does it mean to be secluded from sensuality? I've read a couple of different explanations. One is that you're secluded from sensual pleasures, but that's impossible. I'm just sitting here in the, the cool evening, that's a sensual pleasure. In a quiet place, that's a sensual pleasure. If we had to be totally secluded from sensual pleasures, we'd have to be in prisons with loud music blaring and people fighting all around us, and it would have to be really hot or really cold and just really miserable. And it's really hard to meditate in a situation like that. We have to have some level of pleasure, at least as we're learning how to meditate. And you look in the Pali Canon, and there's a genuine appreciation for the beauties of wilderness. In fact, the early, earliest wilderness poetry in the world, at least that we still have, is found in the Pali Canon. Mahagasapa, the sternest of all the Buddha's disciples, has verses describing the beauties of being in the wilderness, the dark blue of the rock in the mountains, the ladybugs flying around, the sound of the waterfalls. An ideal place to meditate, to bring the mind to stillness. So that can't be what it means to be secluded from sensuality. Another reading I've read is that you have to be totally blanked out from all sensory impressions. In other words, the mind has to be totally unaware of any sight, sound, smells, tastes, or tactile sensations. But that doesn't fit in with the Buddha's definition of sensuality. Sensuality for him is our fascination with our thoughts about sensual pleasures. We love to fantasize about sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations that we'd really like in different combinations. And it's getting the mind to be secluded from that. That's how we bring it to right concentration. And why do we have to be secluded from that? Because there are lots of dangers in sensuality. As the Buddha points out, it's because of sensuality that we have to work to begin with, to get the sensual pleasures we want. Sometimes we get the wealth we want, sometimes we don't. In either case, there's suffering. When we don't get it, all that work is in vain. When we do get it, then we have to be concerned about how it's going to be. It could be burned by fire or washed away by water. Kings or thieves might take off with it. Hateful heirs may get it. It's also because of sensuality that people fight. Husbands with wives, wives with husbands brothers, sisters, parents, children, even in the family, and then it spreads out into society. This is why we have wars. The canon is filled with all sorts of analogies for the drawbacks of sensual pleasures, like a drop of honey on the blade of a knife, like a raptor that's gotten a piece of meat. It flies up, and the other raptor birds try to get it. And if it doesn't let go of that meat, it might get killed. In other words, once you gain something, there are other people who want it. They're going to take it. Someone once asked, why are there so many descriptions of the drawbacks of sensuality in the canon? It's because people are really resistant to seeing those drawbacks. There's a case of a man who's lost his son, and he goes to the cemetery every day and cries over his dead son. One day on the way back from the cemetery, he stops by to see the Buddha. The Buddha asks him, where are you coming from? 
The man says, oh, I've just been crying over my lost son in the cemetery. And the Buddha says, yes, there's a lot of grief that comes from those we love. The man says, what do you mean, grief from those we love? We get nothing but pleasure from those we love. I mean, here he is crying over the person he's lost, and he doesn't even see the connection. The story makes its way to the palace. King Basenity hears this. He calls in his queen, Malika. She's been a disciple of the Buddha. He says, here, your Buddha has said, something, has said this. What do you have to say about that? She says, well, if he says it, it must be true. And he says, get out of here. So she sends a Brahmin to ask the Buddha what he means. And he points out that that people have gone mad over the loss of a husband, a wife, a parent, a child. He tells her one case where a woman has been separated from her husband by her parents. She want, they want to give her to somebody else. So she gets in touch with him and tells him what's happened. So he kills her and then kills himself. And this kind of thing happens because of sensuality. The Brahmin then goes back to Queen Malika, and then she goes in to see the king. And she asks him, do you love this land over which you're reigning? He says, of course I do. Well, suppose something happened to it. Suppose it were destroyed. He said, if it were destroyed, as if my life were destroyed. How about your sons, your daughters, your other queens? How about me? She says. He says, if anything happened to you, it would be as if my life were destroyed. She says, that's what the Buddha meant. And there's an extra poignancy in this story, because we find elsewhere in the Pali Canon that she did die before he did. He got the news when he was visiting the Buddha. He just breaks down and cries. So there's a lot of grief and a lot of violence that comes from sensuality. This is why we have to find another kind of happiness. For as the Buddha said, even when you see the drawbacks of sensuality, if you don't have another kind of happiness to draw on, you'll never be able to let go of your fascination with sensual pleasures. You keep trying to find one other one that doesn't have the drawbacks of the ones you've encountered. Like that story, I think it was Nasruddin. He sits eating a bushel of hot peppers and crying while he's eating the hot peppers. And people ask him, why are you eating those hot peppers? He says, because I'm looking for the sweet one. That's the attitude of the mind. It's always looking for the sweet one, imagining the sweet one, and yet never finding it. So in order to get over our fascination with this kind of pleasure, we need another kind, which is what we're trying to develop here as we meditate. Pleasure that lies on the level of form, just the sense of the body that we're inhabiting here right now, the properties of earth, water, breath, fire, in other words, solidity of the body, the liquidity, the warmth, the energy. When these things are in balance, that gives rise to a different kind of pleasure. pleasure that harms no one. You remember the Buddha. After having been disillusioned with the sensual pleasures, the palace goes off into the, into the forest, into the wilderness. And like many people who've been totally obsessed with sensuality, when he decides that it's bad, he turns in the other direction and tortured himself for six years. And realize that didn't lead anywhere. And so we reflected, could there be another way? He thought of a time when, as, as a child, he was sitting under a tree while his father was plowing. His mind entered the first jhana, rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Accompanied by directed thought and evaluation. That's the standard description. And 
And so he said to himself, here's a pleasure that's not sensual. It's very visceral, but it's not sensual. Why am I afraid of it? It doesn't have any harm. It's not intoxicating. In other words, it doesn't have the same intoxicating effect on the mind. Because sensuality, sensual pleasures, cloud the mind. When you're focusing on something you really like about a sensual object or a person, you tend to focus on certain details and have to block out lots of other details. So, so there's a built-in blindness to that kind of thinking, that kind of pleasure. But with the pleasure of jhana, it doesn't have any drawbacks, it doesn't harm anybody. It doesn't entail the same blindness. In fact, the mind gets a lot clearer, and it's through the clarity of this kind of pleasure that you can begin to see what's actually going on in the mind. So we decided not to be afraid of that, actually to pursue it. It's ironic that sometimes we read about the dangers of getting attached to concentration. There's a book that came out recently in which, I think it was around page five of the book, talks about the dangers of concentration. It's as if we had to be warned off from the very beginning. That's not how the Buddha taught it. There's only once or twice in the canon where he mentions that there are some drawbacks to concentration. The only drawback is that it's not full awakening, and there are times when you can get attached to it. You can build up a sense of pride around it. But these are really minor compared to the drawbacks of sensuality. Nobody ever killed anybody over the first jhana. Nobody ever stole or engaged in illicit sex because of the second jhana. Nobody ever lied, indulged in intoxicants because of the third or fourth jhanas. It's because of sensuality that we break the precepts that we're killing and stealing and cheating one another. And we've been doing this for so long. As the Buddha once said, the the blood that you have shed from having your head cut off for being a robber is more than all the waters in the sea. We've heard about the, the tears that we've shed being more than the waters of the sea, but it's digs a little deeper to think about that we've lost more blood from getting our heads cut off because we've been robbers or because we've been adulterers in each case. The blood is more than the water in all the oceans. That's all because of sensuality. So it's useful to reflect on these dangers, because we tend to turn a blind eye to them. We've turned our blind eyes to them for who knows how long. It's good to remember there's another kind of pleasure, because we go for sensuality because we think there's no other escape from pain. But the Buddha says there is another escape. It's right here. We focus on the breath, focus on the internal sense of the body. Be aware of the different elements in the body. Learn how to bring them into balance, and there can be a very strong sense of pleasure, a very nourishing sense of pleasure. It causes no harm. And this knowledge of the elements of the body will also provide us with a good foundation for discernment. First, the discernment that comes from simply learning to get in touch with these elements and to realize how much of the different sensations in the body, or how many of the different sensations are related to these properties, and how we do have a certain amount of control of them through our perception of these properties. We can emphasize one over another, bring properties that have been out of balance back into balance. And they also provide a, a useful basis for understanding suffering. This tendency we have to 
when there's a physical pain in the body, to glom everything together. It's our ability to separate these things out, to see if the pain is one thing, the physical properties are something else. This is a very useful exercise. It helps bring us to what the Buddha called pleasure that's not involved in baits. Sensuality is bait. And you know what happens around bait. Bait is on a hook. There's the sensuality of right concentration, there's sensuality without bait. And the pleasure of total liberation is, as he says, the sensuality is even more baitless than the sensuality without bait. It's only there that the mind is truly free. Otherwise we're, as the passage we chanted just now, slaves to craving. If you want true freedom, you have to understand this. And work on secluding yourself from sensuality as much as you can. <laughs>